fits at the end of that song, don't you think? No? All right. Welcome, Victorville. Welcome, Victorville. Okay, Victorville didn't show up Apple Valley, so welcome to you and feeling. <laughs> it's early, I know, but we're blessed to have everybody here. If you need a copy of the outline, raise your hand and we'll uh, provide that for you. Uh, no matter where you might be sitting today, or even if you're standing, we'll let you write some things down, take them out of here with you in a few minutes. Hopefully it'll better equip you to uh, face the world the week ahead. We are in the middle of a series, uh, Life Uncensored, Power of Passion. It's about the books of poetry. It's really our third series on our journey uh, we've been calling Route 66, Journey of a Lifetime, as we've been reading through the Bible. Hope you guys are still hanging in. If you are, I've got good news for you. Um, because you are right at the halfway point. Congratulations, you all. We're going to be in Psalm 118. Yeah, you go ahead and clap for yourself. All five of you, go ahead, clap for yourself. Uh, Psalm 118 is where we are today. So if you have your Bibles turned there, we're going to elevate that one. That's one of the Psalms that we read this past week. And uh, it's ironically right in between the shortest chapter in the Bible and the longest chapter in the Bible. The shortest being Psalm 117, which of course you already knew because you read that and you thought, is that it? Just two verses? And then you got to Psalm 119 and it like took two days. You know how the reading assignment it gives you, you know, several chapters and this chapter was so long it took two days to get through one chapter. But uh, we're right in the middle today, Psalm 118. And the interesting thing about Psalm 118 is, it is it's right at the top of the hill. It's downhill from here because we are just over the hump. Verse 8, by the way, is the middle verse to the entire Bible. And I think it's very appropriate as a middle verse because of what it says. Look at Psalm 118. It says right there, verse 8, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. And what, a, what an appropriate thing to, uh, to meet us halfway through because this is really, you guys, what the scriptures are all about. Understanding what God wants for us as his people and recognize that uh, if we're not trusting him, we're trusting a human. Uh, it might be you trusting yourself and, and you are human most days and uh, that's uh, you're trusting yourself you're trusting some you're trusting somebody and it's better to trust the Lord we'll look at that today in the context of Psalm 118 because we're going to try to look at virtually the entire chapter in this presentation and our theme you know what we've been looking at throughout these books of poetry and there are five books of poetry Job Psalms Proverbs Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, or as we have known it for years, the Song of Solomon, which is a little racy, so we'll get to that one later on. But uh, today, we're looking at another element of 
uh, emotion, the rawness of our human heart. And that's what poets do. They talk about how we feel and, and uh, what really is going on inside of us at our core. And every week during this eight-week series, we've lifted up one of those emotions that expose us for who we are, humans, and uh, try to see what the best uh, way to process life through that particular emotion might be. And today we're going to talk about fear. And it is a, a primal emotion, fear. And uh, so I hope those of you who at times have a tendency to fear, uh, worry, anxiety, stress. You know, it's funny because all these emotions kind of bleed together. We've talked about confusion and doubt. Well, how do you draw a clear line between those two? They kind of bleed into one another. And anger and fear, you know, primary emotion, secondary emotion, life just kind of happens. And you, you get what you get. But fear is something that we all deal with, right? I, have you ever been afraid? I was just getting ready to leave yesterday to come to the first uh, service of the weekend. And we had the kids over for lunch yesterday. Uh, the grandkids were there. And a four-year-old grandson, Colton Thomas, he's just, he just got a cool haircut yesterday so he was styling I put some cologne on him so he went to his mom and and said do I smell like a man and uh, she, she said oh yeah baby you smell like a man and and I said so what are you gonna do while pops is is uh, going to the church and he says well we're gonna watch on TV we're gonna watch a movie I said what movie he said the Chronicles of Narnia movie I said oh man those can be scary don't be afraid just remember it's only a movie and he looked right at me and he said pops I'm not afraid of anybody I thought to myself as he walked away, well, you'll get over that soon enough because <laughs> Narnia is a very frightening place to live, isn't it? And the world is too. I mean, our lives can be so fear-provoking. Well, let's define fear this way. Fear is feeling anxious about a frightening prospect. Now, technically, that's all it is. Something evolves on the horizon or emerges on the horizon of life, and it's kind of a... a, a unsettling thing and, and so we begin to feel anxiety you see the line between fear and stress is a very fuzzy line in fact it's non-distinguishable most days now it can also be defined fear can also be defined as reverence or a high level of respect and we're called on to fear the Lord you know so that's like the positive side of fear but that positive side of fear is really something that only we as as believers can experience to have that level of respect for God for the Creator to fear the Lord but the negative side of fear where something happens something begins to emerge and we start to stress over it now it's not just non-believers who do that man we do that too and that's what we're gonna focus on today Jesus said this don't be anxious about anything I'm glad I wasn't there I think I would have snickered at that, which would have been highly disrespectful, and I would have been completely embarrassed. I would imagine the Lord would have extended me grace like he extended everybody grace and has extended me grace in so many ways. But I'm thinking, are you serious, Lord? Don't be anxious about anything? I mean, okay, don't be anxious about a lot of things, but there are some things. How can you not worry? I mean, you got kids, right? I mean, how can you not worry about your kids? I don't care how old they are. I worry more about my kids now. They're growing up. They've got their own families. They're out and about. They're living life. And I worry about them more now than I did when they were in elementary school. Because I had control there. <laughs> you know? I mean, how do we never be fearful, never experience anxiety? You know, there are a lot of challenges in the Bible that are just flat out hard to fulfill. And yet this one, I think, at least for me, is the most difficult of all. And, and I might, you know, be compelled by a book title that says something about eliminating fear. But I'm just here to declare it ain't going to happen. I mean, you could entitle this presentation today and even this chapter. You know, what can we do to reduce our fears? But that is probably the best that you and I can hope for because we are so human. I'm not saying that it's right that we all worry. I'm saying that it is correct that we all worry. And it is true. And some more than others. In fact, some of you just worry some of the time. Others of you have taken it up a level and you worry all the time. 
Still others are taking up another level still. And you worry about the people who only worry part of the time. I mean, we are worried about the fact that people are not worried about the same things we're worried about. We think there's something wrong with them. It's that peace that at times people experience and we think that I'm not there yet. Well, anxiety is a misunderstood concept. In fact, most people only discuss the topic of anxiety or stress, and, and uh, we all go through that regularly, but we only think about it in negative terms. But a guy named Dr. Swenson writes, and he's a Christian doctor, he writes about stress as if it is kind of neutral. That is, it is either positive or, or negative. In fact, he says that stress is simply, and I'm quoting now, and after I quote it, you'll see, Mercer, you would have never come up with that, and that's the truth. Here's the quote, the normal, this is what stress is, by definition, according to Dr. Swenson, the normal physiological mechanism that responds to and helps us adapt to change in our environment. Whenever we experience change, something happens chemically in our bodies. We're confronted with change in our lives, and our brain releases a hormone called CRF, corticotropin releasing factor. I'm not ma I could I make that up? It's not a Greek word. What are you talking about? And that, that hormone evidently arouses the entire nervous system. And the nervous system, in turn, releases adrenaline. And so we feel this, this rush. The brain kicks in natural painkillers. You've heard of endorphins. And, and then as a result of the deployment of those hormones, we become instantly more alert. More oxygen and sugar become available to us. I mean, this is all going on every time we experience change. More blood is pumped into the brain. More blood is pumped into the muscles. Just in case we need to do something to respond to the change in our environment. That is the way God has wired us. We are provoked to alertness. Provoked. <laughs> For example, ladies, you're driving home from church, let's just say, today, driving home from church. It's a pretty good day. I don't know if that was a cough or a sneeze, but God bless you if it was a sneeze. Um, I shouldn't have said that. That's brutal. Anyway, yeah. Sorry about that. Anyway, we're driving home from church, and, and uh, you're, you're thinking, boy, the music was good, and uh, the, the message was somewhat compelling, and and pastors shouldn't have said anything about the guy coughing, but the fact is it was all in all pretty good service. Kids are in the back seat. Your husband says, hey, baby, why don't I take you to your favorite place to have lunch? And you're thinking, oh, man, this is a great day. And you're cruising along, and you're just kind of basking in, in the love that you're feeling, you know, being like dudes like reaching out. And then all of a sudden your husband gets this look on his face because he remembers there's a game on. And he remembers that your restaurant doesn't have a television on every wall. And so he's thinking, I changed my mind, let's go to Chili's. Now, I don't know if Chili's is your kind of place, ladies, and it might be, and there's nothing against Chili's, and I'm, I don't want to, if you're the manager of Chili's, you know, I'm, props to you, and we've been to Chili's, and we love Chili's, so I, I'm not trying to offend you. And if... You're the manager of Chili's and the guy that was coughing a minute ago, man, I'm really piling on right now, so I'm really sorry. But anyway, so this change, in, see what happens? You've got to change in plans. And your, your brain, ladies, this is what happens. Your brain kicks in some CRF. And your nervous system pumps adrenaline, and your brain is generating endorphins, and you're ready for battle. And you, if you're the guy and you're just like driving along, and it was just an innocent suggestion. You know what innocent suggestion is if you're married? It is like an oxymoron. There is nothing, <laughs> there is nothing, there is absolutely, absolutely nothing innocent about a suggestion that changes the plan. And, and then there is a, a state of stress. But it really, and not just for the gals, but for all of us, it is our response that determines whether it's going to be distress, which is the negative form of stress, or what Dr. Swenson calls eustress. 
You stress, I stress. We all stress for you stress. That is a positive kind of stress. You know, sometimes a change in our environment creates this stressful deployment of those chemicals and it actually helps us respond in a positive way. You've heard of athletes who wake up on game day and they get their game face on and the, the adrenaline is pumping and it actually elevates their performance. Mothers, middle of the night you hear your little baby like start to choke four walls away and the husband, is, he's not waking up until morning no matter what but it's just like this very slight little baby kind of sound. And you sit up, you know, and you're ready because as a mom, that's all it takes, and you're ready to do battle on behalf of your kids. And you're at full mental and physical function within like a half a second. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. You know what? I'm, all I'm saying is stress is not always negative. There's a choice to be made. What are we going to do with the adrenaline? Evidently, that's something we have control over. Now, most of the time, we use the word stress to only describe the negativity involved, distress, because we respond so negatively to change. We object to change. I've often said that the greatest addiction in our lives is our addiction to our comfort zone. And when change happens, we're not allowed to feed our addiction, and therefore we experience pain. And it's mental pain, it's not physical pain. And so we respond to that mental pain in an inappropriate way. In fact, we do that on a regular basis, and now what therapists are using as a term is what they call hyperstress. And that's a condition that occurs when the system is stimulated into action. That physiological chain of events that I mentioned a minute ago is, is triggered time after time after time on a regular basis every day of our lives. And it's very typical for people to be in hyperstress. And you're sitting there today and you might be thinking to yourself, that's what my life is like. I mean, it's nuts. And every time your body reacts to stress with distress, irreversible chemical scars are actually created. Tissue damage actually occurs. That's why Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. Do not respond to change in a negative way. Why? Because he just wants you to, well, would you be my, I mean, is it like he just wants you to be happy all the time? Well, he wants us to be filled with joy, but he also knows that stress will physiologically kill you prematurely. We're talking about what your life here. And so what, what do we do? It's that, that mental distress. And, and so we, this is what I love about verse uh, 6. In fact, I want to elevate verse 6 of Psalm 118 before we go any further because it really is the key to minimizing anxiety. What, is, what does the psalmist say? Verse 6, the Lord is with me. Look at that. I will not be afraid. And he goes on to say, what can mere mortals do to me? But the, it's that middle phrase that is so key, you guys. I will not be afraid. Change happens. You know, the CRF begins to like kick in and we have an opportunity to make a willful decision. I will not allow that to kick me into scar tissue hyperstress drive. I am going to use that change and the adrenaline that God's beautiful created design is now pumping through my system to do something positive. And that is a choice that evidently we can make. I love that. I, I will not be afraid. I, I will not be afraid of anybody. And I'm only four. Okay, so is that it? Like, I will not be, I will not be, I will not. Is that like we psych ourselves up? Is this some kind of, you know, positive, you know, mental attitude, kind of mumbo-jumbo, kind of mystical new age, you know, meditating and kind of getting in the right frame of mind? No. I mean, that's nonsense. Then, then how do we will to not be afraid? Are there things that we can actually do, objective things that we can do to beat this thing 
to beat this rap, to, to manage the emotion of fear. Yes, there are. In fact, there are four. In fact, they all come out of Psalm 118, so I'm pretty excited to share them with you today, and I hope we get to all of them. Number one, number one thing we read in the psalm, if you want to manage your fears better, you need to zoom out. Zoom out. And you don't know what that means, which is why I'm going to tell you right now. Daniel J. Uh, Simones and Christopher Chabri, which is a French researcher, these guys ask subjects, this is a funny little story, they ask subjects to watch a videotape and count the number of passes that two people made with a basketball back and forth. He said, now just count them. One, two, three. And then halfway through the videotape, a dude in a gorilla suit walks right into the middle of the action, thumps his chest, and walks off screen. 50% of the people never saw the gorilla. And you're thinking, big whoop. <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about, zoom out. In fact, citing that experiment in his book, his latest book, Great by Choice, Jim Collins, who's a business writer, he describes the danger in business leaders being so focused on a specific event, whether culturally or in terms of economic you know, seasons of, of change, but but they tend to focus on a specific event or a specific circumstance and they don't see the bigger picture. They don't see the context in which, the, the larger context in which that event or those circumstances evolved. And so he challenges, you know, business leaders to zoom out and look at the big picture. You see, in times of difficulty, we tend to zoom in. You and I do the same thing. We become micro-focused on a problem and we fail to consider what God might be doing all around that problem. What God is doing contextually. Either for us, to us, or through us. And we fear because we've zoomed in on something that we perceive as a threat. Something changes. Somebody comes into the picture. Something begins to evolve at work or in our family. And we begin to fear because we zoom in on that something. Now, Collins, as I mentioned, he writes business books. But what's good for business, and by the way, this works for businesses because it's predicated on truth, it also works for individual believers. In fact, the writers of these books of poetry keep saying it over and over and over again. Zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. And what they're saying is, look at God. Look at life from God's perspective. We're only using terminology that those of you who are photographers probably understand because you've got these lenses where you can either zoom in and micro-focus on just one part of the action or you can zoom out and get a more panoramic view of what's going on everywhere. Now David says, we need to zoom out, and then the question is, okay, Dave, how far out do we zoom? And he says, forever. You know what that is? That's a long way out. But he said, look at verse 2, let Israel say, read it with me, let Israel say, his love endures forever. Verse 3, let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever forever. Verse 4, let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. Let those of you who attend High Desert Church say, what? His love endures how long? Forever. You see, zoom out. How big a deal is this? It's a forever big deal. That's why Jesus says, don't be anxious about anything. And you're sitting here thinking, how is that possible? And Jesus like got all these bags of lenses. And he's got this ability, this super macro lens, to be able to zoom out to the precipice of eternity. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And he's able to see everything all at once. What led you to this difficulty? What led you to this crisis? What is going to lead you out of this crisis? And what blessing awaits you when you're through it? He sees it all. That's some pretty solid equipment he's got. And his sight is eternal. See, God's got no faith. Zero faith. God needs no faith. Why? 
because his sight is perfect and it's forever. And yours isn't, which is why you can't live by sight. You and I have to live by what? By faith. Faith in who? This forever guy. You know, zooming out might not even tell you what's coming next. I don't know. But I will tell you, it'll give you a pretty good glimpse of who's going to bring it, whatever it is. Now, here's something interesting um, to me, and I, I always say this since I'm teaching. I'm going to tell you whether you find it interesting or not. It's interesting to me, so it's part of the, part of the deal. But research also uh, describes how people with high levels of ability are actually enhanced. Performance is enhanced in stress. And if you have a low level of skill, then the stress of the nerves actually decrease your efficiency or, or lower the level of your performance, which is why the most highly paid athletes in the world are the ones who are able to come through a crunch time. They're the ones who are able to, when they're nervous, make the big shot, complete the big pass, get that you know, slider on the you know, outside lower part of the plate and get that third strike. You see, when the stress hits, people who have high levels of performance come through. People who have low levels, excuse me, high levels of skill come through in their performance and people with low levels of skill do not come through. Now, what is Jesus saying? Don't be anxious about anything. Trust me. Why? Because Jesus says, I got mad game. I'm like really good. At, at crunch time, if I am in control of your life, you are going to experience high level of proficiency. You see, the, when Jesus says, trust me, the me is the all-powerful creator of the universe. And when we choose to place our trust in Christ, you perform better. That's when you experience eustress. Trust yourself. And you'll fail more often than not, and you'll experience distress. See? Now, is that? That's why we've got to zoom out. We've got to see the sovereign Lord of forever. We've seen that over and over and over again. Now, is that the only thing? Oh, no, that's only one of four. Look at the second one. Express gratitude. Express gratitude. Now, like everything else in this life, the psalm, this psalm begins with an attitude of thanksgiving, and it ends with an attitude of thanksgiving. In fact, I don't know if you noticed it when you read through the 118th psalm, uh, verse 1 and verse 29, first and last verse, are absolutely identical. Look at verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Now, when you read the Psalms. Do you find yourself singing? I mean, really. I mean, we've been set up for this for years. As these wonderful people lead us in worship, we've been singing through the Psalms for like ever, and so we come to these verses, and instead of just reading them academically, we begin to sing them as an element of worship. And look at verse 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. I mean, here we go. You know what this is? You know what? If the first and the last verse are all about giving thanks, this is a gratitude, this psalm is a gratitude sandwich. Everything else we experience within the context of giving thanks. Now, the key word there is not thanks. The key word there is give. Give thanks. And you say, well, am I, you pass Tom, I'm thankful to God. How do you give it? I've got time, you tell me. How do you give thanks? You say, well, I am thankful. I, no, you're not. Not unless you give it. Nobody's thankful until they give it. You cannot be thankful without giving something. This is not as simple as singing a worship song. You know, as you say, oh, I'm just so thankful, Lord. Let me just lay it out there for you. Three words come to mind. Talk is cheap. How do you give thanks? How do you express how thankful you are to God for his enduring love? How? In fact, how have you done that in the past week? Maybe we'll have to go back two weeks. I don't know. In fact, let's take a little, little, little quiz, a little pop quiz. Do you love those when you're in school? Okay, Professor Mercer is going to give you a pop quiz today. 
And we're not going to, you're, you're going to grade it yourself. First question, uh, how have you given thanks in the past week or maybe the past couple of weeks by directing money that God's provided you? By the way, all the money he's given you, he's provided you. How have you taken at least some of that money and directed it back to kingdom causes? In the last week or two, go ahead, write it down. We'll just, I'll just wait. It's a little quiz. Go ahead. All right, all right, let's go on to question number two. How have you given thanks this past week? By serving Christ's church through the spiritual gifts he's given you. And he has given you some, you know. How have you given thanks? He's given you gifts. How have you given thanks for those gifts? By extending service to his body, the church. To his bride, the church. Okay, I'll wait. Just write it down. Last week or two. Yeah, thanks the Lord. Okay, number three. How have you given thanks in the past week or two? By encouraging someone else, someone around you, about the goodness that he's shown you. And I'm not just saying, hey, PTL, bro. I'm saying, sit down, over a cup of coffee. I'm going to explain to you. I have to share this with you. How good God is to me. When was the last time you did that? To your wife, to your husband, for your kids? When? Go ahead, write it down. Let's see. You say, man, bro, I'm having a hard time here. <laughs> okay. You're pretty typical then. Because you know what we are? We're pretty self centered people. And we like to pretend we're thankful without giving it. And until you give it, I, I honestly, you guys, I, and I have no horse in this race, I'm responsible for myself. This is your issue. But you can say anything you want. But if you have to think very long to come up with answers to those questions, then you are flat out not giving thanks. Which is why you're afraid. And I'd like to see that change. I will not fear. How? I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to take what God gives me. And I'm going to give thanks to Him. By extending those resources, those abilities, whatever they are, as an instrument of his grace to the people around me, to the world that needs him so desperately. Number three, number three way that we can will to not fear is to discover margin. Discover margin. Now margin, when we talk about margin, we're talking about that part of your life that is not committed that part of your budget that is not committed before you are paid. It's, it's the, the, the amount in your budget that you don't already have committed before you receive the check. It's the amount of time in your daily schedule that is not committed before you begin your day. That's margin. You say, is that possible? <laughs> Yes, it's not only possible to have some, it's God's will. I mean, look at verse 5. What did David say? When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord, and he brought me into a spacious place. Oh, I love that term. That is a restful term, a spacious place. I mean, I even breathe more deeply when I say it out loud. A spacious place. And you say, man, the walls of, of economics and the walls the expectations of my schedule and the walls and expectations of the people around me and the people at work and my spouse and my family and my friends are just like closing in and I can hardly breathe. And that's how the psalmist felt. And you know what that did to him? It scared him. And it provokes fear in you. It does. And me. It does. And what do we do? We cry out to the Lord. And when we follow God, He brings us into a spacious place. Oh, man, that's awesome. You know, there are four gears to life. In fact, this is uh, another quote from Dr. Swenson's book. But the first gear he calls park. And that's the gear where you are just being refreshed and you're recharging your batteries. It's those seasons of rest and renewal. And perhaps it's been far too long since you've enjoyed one. A second gear is, is low, low gear. And that's the gear for relationships 
or we have conversations with people in our oikos, in our family, and, and, and we're not nervously waiting to move on to the next gig or the next conversation. We're just relaxed and we're living in the moment. It's what we call quality time. And then the third gear is drive. And drive is usual gear for work and, and, and even for play. We use a lot of energy, and the speed with which we travel actually feels pretty good because it's productive time. And then there's this fourth gear we call overdrive. And it's the gear that's reserved for those requirements for extra effort. You know, we got a deadline looming on the horizon. Man, we kick into overdrive. And, and when you're getting ready for church and you're late for church, say, all right, guys, let's go! And we kick into overdrive. Now, unfortunately, many of us are in overdrive all the time, right? And, you know, you could, have, you could have the fastest vehicle in the world. You could have some of the most uh, beautifully crafted, meticulously uh, designed vehicles in, in the entire world, exotic race car. And, man, they're fast, see? It's like zero to 60 and whatever. I mean, you don't even know. So, boom, you hit it. And you're on it. But you cannot, even those vehicles, you cannot ramp up consistently into overdrive all the time. The engine will burn up. And like engines and exotic sports cars, spirits and bodies on a human being respond the same way. And you have to gear down. And doing that sometimes for some people is like unthinkable. And you're burning the candle at both ends, right? And, and what did the, the smart guy say a few years ago? If you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. Look at what Hebrews 12 says. Hebrews 12, 1. I know we're fast-forwarding now hundreds of years and, and many chapters forward, but Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us throw off two things, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, so that we can run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I mean, we want to do what God wants us to do, and He's got some ideas for our future. And so we have to get rid of two things. We have to get rid of the bad things, the sin. And then we have to get rid of a whole other category of things that are not bad. Sin is bad. There's no conversation here. Thou shalt not. Right? So get rid of that. Whatever it is. But then there are good things that we have to say no to. We have to stop being a people pleaser. Always trusting that others have the best ideas when it comes to time to schedule our money or times to schedule our time and our energy. You know, everybody around you has a, a will for your life. And at times you have to say no. I do that. I've had to say no. I've gotten in trouble. I've offended people. You know, Pastor Tom, will you get involved? Will you come? Will you do this? No. Well, don't you love us? Oh, yes, I love you, but not that much. <laughs> and I do. I love you. I love the church. I, love, I, I just love people generally. I love non-believers. But I also know my limits. And I also know that if I'm going to have that spacious place that I'm going to be able to operate and recharge and be refreshed and not crash and burn, I know people in my position who were in overdrive too long. And by the way, they're not in my position anymore. I know that. And I don't want to be that guy. And you don't want to be that guy. And you might not be in vocational ministry, but, I mean, you pick a vocation. <laughs> Pick a marriage, pick a, a, a relationship, pick anything. You cannot do this. You have to say, what? Let me just give you permission to say no. Everybody on the count of three, just say no. One, two, three. There you go. Now, is that that hard? Say no, Pastor Tom, we're talking to you. And, and I, you need that permission and you need that freedom. And I'm not saying use it as a weapon. You have to be prayerful here. You have to consider what the Lord wants you to do with everything that He's given you. And, and I can't tell you how many times people, you know, they come and say, would you like to donate a certain, you know, even a little bit of money, you know, for some noble cause? How many times I say no? I walk away and they have no idea the thousands of dollars that my wife and I give 
to charity and to the work of God. They have no idea. And I, I'm not here to please them. But I say no. God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life. I'm following that, not your plan for my life, by the way. And it doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean I, I don't think you're doing a great thing. It doesn't mean whatever cause you're standing up for is not a great cause. But we have to protect our spirit from crashing and burning. And the reason right now you're living on the edge of fear is because you're just overwhelmed, maybe. That's part of it. I will not be afraid. I will not let the world do this to me. I refuse. I will give God time. For what? For me, the opportunity to zoom out. See? For me, the opportunity to give thanks. And margin is the only thing that allows that to take place. And sometimes that's where we start. You know? Sometimes that's where you have to begin. All right, well, I beat that sucker to death. Let's move on to number four. Last, you know, no big shock here. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. Look at verse 7. Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Verse 8. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. Center piece of the entire Bible. Verse 9. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Look at this. Even the really rich people and influential people and great people, even the real sharp people, even the people that everybody wants to be in their oikos kind of people, the shakers and the movers, the real impressive ones, the popular ones, compared to how God loves you, they don't. That's why you trust Him. We trust a lot of things. Even when they begin to falter, we trust a lot of things. We trust pilots and jets. We trust pilots. Never met the dude. Never met the gal. Crisp blue suit, nice hat, set of wings. Hey, I'm good to go. Let's go with that guy. Let's get on that guy's plane. How do you know? Can you explain to me how a 970,000 pound vehicle can even fly? I can't either. You know, they say a good landing is one from which you can walk away, but a great landing is one after which they can use the aircraft again. <laughs> <laughs> or my favorite is the little old lady who walking off the plane, and there's the pilot to say thank you for flying our airline, and she says, Sonny, did we land or were we shot down? Turbulence. You guys love turbulence? You just flying along? A little bit of turbulence? It's good for the soul. You know what happens? When that change occurs in your life, you know, all of a sudden you got CRF, right? Stuff's like pumping. And and you're like white knuckling. You're like holding hands with the person next to you. You might not have even gotten on the plane with that person. And it does not matter because you are petrified. You are afraid. And then the turbulence settles down and you'll fly again. We trust other drivers on the road driving thousands of pounds of steel at 80 miles an hour down the freeway. And we trust them. Never met them. We trust a whole ton of them all around us all the time. Never met them. We have no idea if they maintain their vehicles. We, we, we still drive. We trust the cook at the restaurant. We trust the guy who printed the little A letter on the sign on the front window. How do you know that's not fabricated? You, and we trust the FDA. You guys, that is a government agency. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know what we do every day? We just trust, 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 trust. We got faith, 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 faith. We got faith coming out of our ears. Faith all the time. In all these people, we don't even know. All these systems, we have no expertise in. Hit a little turbulence, it's okay, everything will be fine. And then we trust Jesus. 
And you know, the message, a little bit compelling, we're all excited, we're getting all worked up about, you know, that we need to trust the Lord a little more, and so the song starts to move us, and we say, oh Lord, I'm going to trust you, I'm going to trust you, I'm going to trust you with my, you know, everything, I'm going to give everything, I'm just going to trust you. And then a week or two later, we hit a little turbulence, and what are we ready to do? We're ready to find a parachute and bail out. You know what that is? That's stupid. And that's us. And there's no shame in admitting that, by the way. I'm not being condescending when I say it. You want to look at the stupid line? When you're in that line, you're looking at me, I'm in the front of the line. So who are you going to trust? Let me tell you, verse 10, all the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them down. Verse 13, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Verse 15, shout of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Who are you going to trust? Who are you going to put your faith in? This week. Are you going to fly the friendly skies? Are you going to trust Jesus? Are you going to hit that turbulence? I'm telling you, you're going to. Maybe you have to grab hands with somebody next to you, but don't bail out. Don't bail out. Remember, he's got, he's got mad game, man. He's... He's good at getting through the storms, and he will get you through the storm. And that's the whole point of the last part of this chapter. You know, often as the Bible writers zoom out, they just look back on how God has been faithful to Israel. And we've read this in books of history. We've read this in the books of poetry. They look, remember that? They look back and they say, well, look at what God has done. Sometimes they look forward. Remember last week with Asaph, and, and he zoomed out, and he looked at the future of the evil those. Remember Asaph was bumming because, oh, the pagans are being blessed more than me and God says well zoom out and he zooms out and he looks forward and he sees that they all are doomed eventually and so he says okay well I feel better now all right so he zoomed out he didn't look back he looked forward sometimes the the Bible writers the poets especially now with David he zooms out and he looks back and forward boy that's the best of both directions that's what he does here you see, what David does in his zoom out season here, his moment of zoom out, he's not just reflecting, but he's predicting. And he's building a bridge between the past and the future. Look at verse 22. Stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now he's referring to the nation of Israel. He's talking about how Israel is a nation rejected by everybody else, but chosen by God. Now a cornerstone, that's foundational. In the ancient world, cornerstones actually supported the weight of the building. Today, if there's a cornerstone that's laid before some building is constructed, it's mostly ceremonial. It's become synonymous with whatever kind of foundation is placed underneath whatever you're going to build. But it's foundational. And what the psalmist is saying is that Israel and, and the ministry of Israel, the mission of Israel to the world in this plan that God has is foundational. And he looks back and he says the nation of Israel was the cornerstone and the rest of the nations rejected it, but God has chosen it for this special foundational role. But then Jesus picks up the torch and Jesus declares that he is the cornerstone. Remember that? He says that I am the one who is rejected by the world, but whom God has chosen. And I am the foundation on which this plan of redemption will evolve. And look at verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God. He's made his light shine on us with bows in hand, joining the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Now those words of the Hallel, the Jewish Hallel, this is what they chanted. When Jesus actually, remember this? When he marched into Jerusalem, he didn't march, they were marching. He's riding on that donkey into Jerusalem. We call it the triumphal entry of the Messiah. And this is what they said. About who? About the nation of Israel in the past? No, about the Messiah in the future. And David is writing messianic literature. He doesn't even know it. But we do. Because God is building a bridge from the past to the future. And what, you guys, I got a question for you. What's in the middle of the past and the future? The present, which, by the way, is where you're living right now. And God is saying to you today do not be afraid. Got the thing handled. Got mad game. I've been doing it for a long time. Look back. Look forward. And then look at where you are. And he concludes in verse 28. You're my God. I'll praise you. You're my God. I'll exalt you. I'll exalt you. You're my God. You're not just the God of my forefathers. You're not just the God that's going to come, you know, when the Messiah shows up hundreds of years later. You're my God. You know why we fear? Because we zoom in. Let me just walk you through this. Very, very brief. This is what I'll end with. We fear. Got a little sequence here. Because we zoom in. We fear others. Something happens. Somebody begins to lean on us. Our margins are gone, whether we're talking economics or schedule, and the walls begin to, you know, like close in, and we're afraid, and we focus on that difficult situation. And what do we do then? We zoom out. And we have to renew our faith in this one who's building these bridges for like ever of deliverance. And then what does he want us to do next? Zoom right back in on the same people who scared us before. But instead of being afraid of them now, what are we going to do? We understand our mission is to bless them. You know what? We are called, you and I, all of us are called to be blessings to the world. And you cannot bless someone and be afraid of them all at the same time. Which is why Jesus said, don't be afraid. I am sending you to them so that they can understand what mercy looks like, what grace is like. Our purpose to be a blessing to the people around us. Which is why the only line you'll find, you know what the only line is that you'll find in every single book in the Bible? This one line in every book of the Bible. Do not be afraid. All right. So you got, Mar you got your marching orders. All those things that are freaking you out. You know, take this outline this week. Just try it. Try it. And will, will yourself out of at least most of those fears most of the time. I know you're just a human, but you are a Christian human. So let's take advantage. Let's leverage that relationship, you guys. It's about for prayer. Father, we thank you. We're just excited to uh, think about the future without as much anxiety. Give us that ability to not only see your hand in our lives, but to enjoy the muscles that those hands have and just how strong you are and how you can deliver and care for us even in the midst of a crisis and with everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed just very briefly some of you don't know Christ don't know God you haven't trusted Jesus with your life and I know that uh, just because I I'm sure in a room this size with as many people as are in attendance today that's got to be true you know it because you're you and you are trying to negotiate Narnia. I mean, man, this can be a very dangerous environment to live in. And that is why God sent His Son. And you need to admit that you need a Savior. Believe that Jesus can save you. Because He can. He really, really, really can. And He will if you will choose. Admit, believe, choose. A, B, C. Choose to place your faith in Him. And when you do that, your life is changed. Your eternal destiny is transformed. Your world is, is on, on the verge of changing as well because God wants to send you right back in there to be a blessing to those people. It's a great life. But only uh, in Christ can we be free from our fears.
temporally, eternally. Lord, just give insight to the people in, in these auditoriums, wherever they are in their spiritual journey, insight into these truths. This week we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. We'll see you next time. Leave your welcome form back there in the baskets.